Welcome again to the National Federation of the Blind, Genesee County chapter. <laughs> <laughs> but it is us. The National the Federation, Federation of the Blind, of the blind Genesee County. Genesee chapter. And here is your co-host. Mr. Leo Naper, aka Father Time. You see how she took that? That's why, that's why she's here with me. And I don't think the duration of the blind messed up every time. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I can't see the of in it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we have a very special guest here today. A very special guest. Matter of fact, he's going to be our keynote speaker at the gala. When, when, when is the gala? Sheila. Now he's calling me his co-host name as well. We're really off to a good start this morning. Um, he is going to be our keynote speaker at our gala, which is Saturday, June 24th at the Flint Institute of Art from 6 to 9 p.m. And just so that I can remind you, there's no ticket sales at the door. So please visit the Music Planet in Flint on Carpenter Road to purchase tickets or ticketspice.com, please. That's ticketspice.com. And as we used to say back in the day, the music planet on Carpenter Road. <laughs> you know, all kind of downloads, gospel music, anything you want. They've been in business for quite a few times. And we really, we really appreciate them for what they've been doing and, and the sponsors that they've given us. But today I say we have a very special guest here worldwide known artist, Dr. Massey. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Well, I'm doing you, great. <laughs> doing great. You, you, you don't sound, you, you don't sound, you, you got to have a little bit more enthusiasm, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing awesome. It's a yeah. great day. And, uh, you know, another day, uh, I always tell people, uh, when you get the when you get to wake up in the morning, you get another day to make it right if you didn't do it right the day before. So, yes, I like what I like what you said, you know, because like a lot of times, and even with me, when I wake up, a lot of times I look around and say, "Here we go again," but I'm right. thankful. <laughs> so I'm thankful right. to be able to say, "Here we go again," and let's get it right. <laughs> anyway, but uh, you know, I don't know a lot of. I to be honest with you, I had. I had heard your name, but I never related it with, uh, you know, an artist, anybody, and especially being over the Flint to Art, I was in there a couple of times, and I someone had mentioned that you had did a, a, a painting in there, and I still, yes. but this recently, I found, I'm like, oh my goodness, I've been talking about this man, and been hearing his name all these years, and had no idea who mm -hmm. he was, but I had right. yeah, the impact that you've had uh, in the mm -hmm. art world. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so originally I'm from uh, uh, I was I'm, I'm from Flint. I was uh, uh, went to Flint Beecher Beecher High School. That's where I grew up at. Um, went to um, I played uh, played sports. I was playing football and running track up at uh, up at Beecher, and um, I ended up getting a scholarship to go to Grand Valley State University where I played football there and ran track. Uh, in high school, I was all state in track. I got up to uh, Grand Valley. Um, I was um, uh, uh, all conference, all district. I was up for all American. I suffered a knee operation. And because um, I got I got um, I got injured on the on in the game. And it's kind of ironic because some, sometimes when things like that happen, one door closes and another door opens. Um, that's where it's a true blessing. So I end up, uh, uh, my professor said, you need to go to Europe. This, uh, we have a school over there, a sister school called the University of London, Slade Institute of Fine Art. And I ended up getting a scholarship to go over there. And when I went over there and got to see all the artwork, it changed my world. And um, uh, I was there around when I was 21, and I came back and I've seen the world totally different. Um, uh, I was still interested in football, but football and uh, and the sports uh, seemed like it took the 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 um, it was on the back burner because I put the art in the front. I just took the same discipline that I used for sports and I just put it into the art. 
and know, eventually uh, uh let me ask you a question real quick like we were talking yesterday you know you did a lot of firsts as far as with school you was talking about you, you threw discus yeah i was a discus thrower so discus in in michigan came out in 1976 i was only black in the top five in the state of Michigan that was actually throwing the discus and actually uh, placing. Uh, by the time I got, so 76, 77 is when I graduated. I was all state in discus. I uh, went to the state finals and uh, I mean, I won the regionals, went to the state finals. I ended up uh, taking second, but um, uh, yeah, I ended up taking a second. So the first two ended up becoming all state. And that's how that's how I ended up winning the uh, state honors, though. But discus was pretty interesting because my coach was named Marty Crane. He went to the uh, Olympics in Montreal, and he brought back a film on uh, uh, it was in Jack it was Jack Wilkinson. I think he was throwing the discus, and uh, I looked at it on the reel to reel. He let me take a, home a reel to reel film. And each frame, I was watching this guy, how he was throwing the discus, and that's how I learned. And because Beecher didn't have, we didn't have a, a, a real great facility. I mean, we still had cinder track. And so he took two by fours and four by eight sheets, two four by eight sheets, nailed them to the two by fours, and chalk drew a circle on the platform. And that was how I learned how to throw a discus off of a, four by eight sheets of plywood that's pretty you know and also you know uh you was talking about your knee injury a lot of times mm -hmm. when an athlete gets hurt the world seemed to collapse around him uh right you know you had a lot of support too coming up didn't you oh yeah oh tons you know that's that was the beauty about being in, in beecher district because the community there the parents the uh families i mean they were very supportive I mean, even to this very day, uh, when there was a game, uh, if you didn't get there early, it's going to be standalone only, yes. you know. So, uh, but the the parents and um, and the teachers were. I mean, it was a time. I, I think in the in the sixties when the teachers also lived in the same community. Yes, that they that they that they served and stuff, which was really unique. And uh, uh, so the teachers became our neighbors. And they lived in in the neighborhood and all, uh, but it was a very unique uh, uh, a community, and still is to this very day. Doctor uh, Doctor Massey, you know uh, something else too. You you had a lot of family support, and the reason I'm asking you that is because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us that's blind or low vision, you know, mm -hmm. we don't. A lot of times, the family don't really know how to support, and that's something that's really important. Right. And that's why I was asked yes. about the support because without that. We just kind of like flutter around for a long time until we get that yeah. that can kind of yeah. stabilize us. Uh, yeah. So you had you, your your family supported you, didn't they? Oh yeah, my 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 father and my mother, both of them were very supportive. My dad was an athlete, uh, and he he played basketball. Actually, he he had went to school to Arkansas A and M, but he didn't finish. He went for three years, and then he got drafted. But uh, and my mom, she was uh, she went to school at Virginia State uh, College because uh, she's from Virginia. But she did a couple years, and then she wasn't able to finish. But they were very supportive, um, you know. And I was in the art, and a lot of times I know parents might not see there's a any financial gain going into the artistic field. But um, I was really grateful that my my parents, my mom, and my dad said that, you know, maybe one day this might feed you and all. And uh, uh, so I, you know, that was, it was just awesome support. They they support us, uh, uh, me and my brothers and sisters, because uh, I'm the oldest out of four. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they, they, they were very, very supportive. Uh, and you need that. Right. You need that, you need that, you need that support because that, I mean, that, that goes a long way knowing that somebody has your back and uh, they, they, they're they supporting you in your endeavor and what you want to do. Let me ask you this. 
when you're coming up, were you uh, scribbling on a lot on the walls or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, fair? but I was yeah. put, put, put that down, boy. What's wrong with you? <laughs> no, but but you know, I but I did do a lot of drawing. My mother used to do. Um, I remember my mother in the basement. Uh, she drew uh, uh, Mickey Mouse and Daffy Duck, and then uh, and and then my dad used to he because he used to work at the post office. He used to bring home paper all the time, and uh, and I used to draw on the paper. I I didn't think nothing of it. I just like drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was peaceful. It was one of those uh, things um, that um, you know you 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 pass the time away by you know doing some drawing, or you know back then we were building model cars and planes and stuff like that. We had, you know it was pretty interesting because coming up, you know back in the seventies or so. Um, you know, we did a lot of hands-on things and we were very creative, um, uh, uh, of doing things, Right. you know, I mean, today, today you got the technology and, you know, you got your phone and people on the phone and all, but we were hands-on on a lot of things. I mean, if we wanted to play some, some go outside and play, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't see many kids playing, <laughs> playing in the street or, you know, um, in the organized baseball, all we needed was a glove, a ball, and a bat, and, and now, you, you, you might have six people, and you form a team. <laughs> now it's now it's uh, uh, now it's, it's it's electronic ball, and everything's done That's on right. the screen. Uh, That's right. When you 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 said something that was really interesting uh, that I thought when I was speaking to you before, and mm -hmm. uh, about uh, about posters. But how you was to work with posters and sign sign painting. Now a lot of times when people yes. think about sign painting, they're thinking you know that you're talking about making a sign for Eat It Burger Joe's or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, did, you did sign paintings for uh, uh, for General Motors and companies, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. All, so I work for I work for the the company it was Gannett Outdoor, uh, Outdoor Sign Company at the time. But when I was at the I went to the Skills Center. And we, I, I had a um, commercial art class. I'm looking out the window, and the, you know, there's a big Buick sign when you come in the, the city of Flint, uh, yeah. over to by a Bishop Airport. You come in, you see this big old sign that says "Welcome to Buick" or something like that. Anyway, they used to have cars on there, and I noticed one day the guys they were hand painting the car. I said, "Guys, are those guys painting?" I had no idea. They were painting that. I was just looking at it. I said, man, these guys look like they're painting. But I didn't think nothing of it. I didn't make no connection that down the line, that that that's the thing I will be doing too. And um, uh, so uh, how I got into that, I met an artist by the name of Paul Collins in Grand Rapids. And um, he was a very prominent artist. Uh, actually, he was the artist that really put me on that trajectory to doing the uh the the art and the large scale artwork uh because he um was a sign painter randy brown was a sign painter and um uh he was the first artist african-american artist I ever met that had a family that was raising a family and being an artist and he was success successful at that he was on good morning america uh, this is back in the 70s he was on ebony magazine jet magazine he used to call me when he was out of town. Sometimes he was in Japan. Sometimes, I mean, he was traveling all over the world. And uh, I was just really, truly inspired. And he told me, he said, you want to learn how to be an artist? You need to be a sign painter. So a sign painter is painting billboards. And billboards, no matter how photographic they look, they were all hand painted. They were done in oil paints. We painted 40 to 50 hours a week every, every day or every day. And um, uh, for 12 years, within a year and a half when I was working for the company, uh, I, I came in as a apprentice. Within a year and a half, I became a journey. And I was painting large faces, celebrity faces, uh, automobiles, all that kind of stuff. But that's where basically I got my training from because I got to paint so much. And to me, the discipline of being able to paint every day, being able to draw every day, was just unbelievable to me. It reminded me of uh, sort of like the 17th century Baroque where artists used to, um, they just drew all the time because see, they had no television 
uh, 700 years ago. And they had no other distractions other than drawing and painting. So imagine just painting and drawing every day, you know, 40, 50 hours a week. And that's all you did for your whole entire life. You can't help but get good. So uh, 12 years of that, that was my apprenticeship uh, program to me. And uh, by the time I, uh, uh, by the time the digital age came in and, and wiped out all the artists, I had already bridged over and started doing murals. And this is before murals even got popular. I've been doing murals since 1992 in, in public Dr. art. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to make sure the kids understand what you were doing when you keep saying signs. What he was doing, he you see the posters you put on the walls today. Well, yes. back then, what they did, they actually hand painted the posters. This is what he's talking right. about. A lot of the yeah. posters that you see back in the day, and uh, I've seen an old Buick poster go for as much as $25,000. So right. You, right. You, instead of taking a picture and digitally put it on a piece of paper, Dr. Right. Man actually had to hand paint them. So, hand paint them. Mm -hmm. who, inspired, who really inspired you? To, to hand paint them? No, or to, the art, the artwork. Once you went to Europe, I mean, who is yes. who really inspired you? Who who the, who's the person that really pushed you along and became your mentor? Oh, uh, well, it was it was Paul Collins and Randy Brown, um, but um, but uh, of course it all started from my from my parents because they 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 were pretty ins ins instrumental in um, in me doing the uh, uh, doing the artwork, but when I when I uh, my professor said that you know that there's a there, there's a school that you should go to, so I, I went there. I ended up getting a scholarship going there, but I was really truly inspired by uh, Randy Brown and uh, Paul Collins. And uh, you can probably see some of their work. Uh, uh, Paul Collins' work. He's uh, he's still he's in his eighties now, and uh, he's still doing artwork, and I still communicate with him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, your parents allowed you to live the life you want. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. They gave me a lot. They gave me a lot. They gave me a lot of freedom to be able to to do the art and to see that there was a reality to that, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying you need to get a job. <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so that I mean that 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 right there, it, before anything else, that right there was the. So the gateway for me having an opportunity to be able to uh, kind of define myself as that artist and to develop myself as an artist uh, without uh, feeling that I need to uh, to have something else to supplement that. And 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 uh, one of the other things, and I, and I try to tell students and all, even though you have a gift, but. Uh, you don't want to put your gift in the front, or you don't want to put. I always say you don't want to. You don't want to put the baby to work uh, when the baby hasn't matured in level. So when I say maturity, mature is your ability to be able to execute at the highest level possible. So, so getting a job and working uh, for somebody is not a bad thing. You know, I, I just happen to work in the in the field of art. But any job that supports uh, your ideals and, and your, your abilities to be able to create is a wonderful thing because it keeps the pressure off of your art until your art fully develops. When your art fully develops and it becomes, um, it becomes profitable more so than what your job is, then you can switch over. But a lot of times students go to school they get out and they just want to, well, I'm going to go into my own business. I'm going to create this artwork and stuff. Well, now the artwork is sort of stressed because now it's got to make money. And if it has to make money, the quality of the art would, would lag behind because it's under pressure and you don't want to do that. Absolutely. So you want to have something, you want to have something, you want to have something to be able to, to afford you to do what it is that you enjoy doing and to develop that. And then once that development happens, that it becomes uh, more uh, profitable down the end, that it can sustain itself, then you can bridge over. Right. But in the meantime, in the meantime, you know, you can, su you can support that by, you know, uh, when I say get a job, it could be any, I mean, 
they they have so many there's so many wonderful opportunities um uh, we have a we have a place called the uh uh carpenters and millwright and they're looking for people to come in and they will pay you to learn a skilled trade <laughs> for two years and then when you come out you license mm -hmm. and so during that time you're supporting yourself you, you got a roof over your head you, you're feeding yourself mm -hmm. and you if you and you're doing your artwork you're developing your artwork and your artwork is another stress and strain. And and now you also have a skill on top of that. That's a beautiful blend. Got to tell that to all young people and individuals, even ourselves, is that to set yes. a goal, but don't, you know, you have to crawl where we go. You That's have to right. Crawl before That's right. You <laughs> and it's okay. It's okay. To, That's it. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you're not, but set your dreams or set your goals and write them down. Yep. And go at it right. step by step, one foot in front of the other. That's all. That's right. You know, uh, right. you were you were talking about you have a you have a very unique ability. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I think you've done something like that here at the Flint Institute of Art in in, uh, in Flint, and it's called was mm -hmm. it Fris Frisco? Fre fresco. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. Fresco is the uh, it's uh, painting and uh, painting and wet plaster. So Michelangelo did the Sistine Chapel. That's a fresco painting, okay? And frescoes are considered one of the hardest mediums to paint in because when you paint in, the surface is drying. So you got to move pretty fast. You got to be sure about yourself. It will expose weaknesses if you're not if you're not secure within your ability to execute because the surface is drying. Whatever you put down stays down. Drips right or wrong is going into the surface there's no way you can extract that so you have to work through your problems on the surface of a fresco uh painting so uh the oldest form of fresco is if you went into a cave cave is thousands of years old and the cave is all limestone there's limestones on the wall somebody takes the red dirt the red dirt happens to be oxidized pigments so the red dirt, you mix with water and you paint a picture up on the wall in the cave and you have cave paintings mm -hmm. that last for thousands of years or so. So somebody came up with the idea of scraping the limestone off the wall of a cave, letting the air dry, uh, and then adding water to it and turn it to a paste and plastering. That's where you get plastering from. Okay. And, you pla and you plaster, and then you take the red pigment or you take the oxidized pigment from the earth, mix with water, and you paint on the surface while the, while the surface is still wet. And you have a, a fresco paint. Now you're just one of how many people in the United States is able to do this? Um, there's less than if I'm, this is more than, but there's less than there's probably less than five probably no more than three fresco artists in the United States. You know, so when I, you know, when I hear different things that you've done and you accomplished, uh, it really lets me know, and especially when you're speaking, how important mm -hmm. it is to have that support, how important it is to set goals for your life and let no one stop you, let no one interfere with your with your forward motion. And you also right. seem like you really have a passion for this. And I think a lot of our kids need to know if they have an accomplishment, or they want to succeed in doing something. Right. They can look at you and other people as a mentor, as a role model, and the right. things that you say are really helping. I'm hoping that a lot of the low vision and blind kids that's going to be listening to this, well, listening to this, mm -hmm. realize that there's all types of opportunities. I know I heard a comedian say his mother used to tell him, uh, "You're not going to be, you're not going to make money uh, being silly." But yeah, he's like mm -hmm. one of the top comedians. A lot of people say, "What are you going to hide? Are you going to make money drawing pictures?" Look at you, mm -hmm. one of the tops, one of the tops in the world. So if you yeah. have that gift, the ability to do it, put your mind to it and make mm -hmm. sure you got that support in order to do it. Right, and then then there's and there's also the discipline. If you're in the art or any type of anything that you do, take 15 minutes out of a day. You know, write it down on the calendar. The, the, a certain time when you start it, to do your 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 to develop your gift. If your if your gift is drawing, then you need to draw 15 minutes a day. That's all. 
15 minutes a day and expand it to, you know, uh, uh, 30 minutes. But 15 minutes a day, pick a time out of the day, you know, and, and, just, and just draw. Draw, draw for 15 minutes and then put your pencil down and do some of the other things that you have to do. But the next day, you come back at a certain time again, pick up that pencil, and you draw again. I'll guarantee you by the end of the year, if you did this every day, by the end of the year, you will see a difference in your abilities, in your drawing, and your abilities of thinking. Uh, it's, and it works with any discipline that you into, whether or not you plan a guitar, whether or not you, you plan an instrument, whether or not you are trying to work on your ability to be an athlete, uh, all that. You just need to put in the time and put in the work. And uh, we all have the power to do great things. It's just a matter of just making commitment and being able to do those things and making sure that you protect your gift, protect your gift with all costs. That means that, you know, you don't let other stuff get in the way of you, of your blessings that God has given you uh, as far as for a gift. So you want to make sure that that gift is protected. You know, I mean, I I see, uh, you know, like some athletes, uh, like the NBA uh, star uh, uh, who was burnishing the, uh, uh, he had a a weapon or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, he's putting his gift at risk, you know, and he's not protecting that. And plus he's not surrounded by people uh, who are supportive of him being successful and you only as good as the folks that you surround yourself with if you surround yourself with good people people who um who are ambitious people who are trying to do things then you can't help but do things that are good and ambitious so this you know it's it's uh, um uh, and people give you value People who you surround yourself with give you value. Uh, if it's good value or bad value, they give you value. So you want to make sure you surround yourself by people who are trying to do some things. You you have a lot of good. A lot of your artwork is here in Michigan, isn't it? Now we're down in Detroit. Yeah. You have a mural, don't you? something? Would you? Show- I have I have, After- yeah, I have seven. Mm-hmm. Would you I have show- seventeen my- artwork yeah. at, so that our viewers can. Look up and go and see. Would you share a few places that it's at? Yeah, so I, I designed the floor at the Charles H. Wright Museum. I did the uh, campus marshes. Uh, I did the Federal Reserve Bank in the city of Detroit. I did Center for Creative Studies parking lot structures, 30 foot by 30 foot tile mural. I did Paradise Valley. It used to be Harmony Park. It's one of the oldest parks in the city of Detroit. I redesigned the park. Uh, there's a uh, twenty-something medallions that's there, and it's all in terrazzo. Mm-hmm. Um, I did the uh, Detroit Athletic Club. I'm the first African American artist to ever be commissioned there since 1915. Wow. I did uh, two fresco paintings up in there. Uh, I did the IRS uh, uh, building uh, on the Michigan and Bagley. Um, I did the um, oh my God, I did Tabernacles Church. I did a 25 foot by 15 foot stained glass uh, in the city of Detroit. I did neighborhoods where in Rosedale Park I did eight tile murals uh, on eight uh, different dugouts, and I had uh, 300. Uh, uh, um, 300 people, 100 people a day uh, assist me on, on doing the tiles. Wow. Um, this, and in Southfield, I did the Lawrence Tech. I did six monoliths that's made out of tile. We just completed the, the obelisk uh, in the Southfield um, uh, this, uh, this, this past week. And uh, I'm doing a fresco painting at the Huntington Banks uh, uh, place. Uh, it's their headquarters, three doors down from the Fox Theater. I'm doing their lobby. My goodness. So it's yeah, that that's just in that's just in the Detroit. I have pieces in Grand Rapids. <laughs> I also did the piece that's it off of Saginaw Street. It's kind of faded now. Saginaw and uh, Street and, and well, it's near Saginaw 
on Detroit Street in Flint. There was a large mural on the Marion, Marion building, something like that. It was That's your six work? stories or so. That was me. That's your work. Yeah. That. You know something, you know, <laughs> since she asked that, I think anybody in Detroit, if you look around enough, they're gonna see, they're gonna see you there. Oh yeah, I'm all I'm all over. <laughs> I can tell it. I'm, and I'm I'm familiar with you, the one here in Flint. I've I've seen that so many times. That's yeah. your work. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's faded. Uh, hopefully one day I get to go back and, and repaint it and um uh, and uh bring it back to life again. Mm -hmm. But that was a um uh, uh I did community forums uh for that to really celebrate the community because I'm really I'm really um um interested in telling the, the 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 stories of the community and the and the stories that's in the community and um and uh uh putting them in the mural form. I just did one at Stellantis. Stellantis is Chrysler Chrysler was bought out by Stellantis. We just did a uh a, a eight hundred foot eight hundred foot mural we just completed and I'm getting ready to start up a thousand foot mural. Oh Fifteen feet by one thousand feet long. So a lot of these billboards, so the, by you doing working in the billboards for so long, this transitioned to you really well into what you're doing now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't God, think, isn't yeah. God good? <laughs> <laughs> All the time. So, so you know, and, 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 and how I got into fresco painting is because I found out that Diego Rivera uh, was a sign painter when he was doing frescoes. So, and when his when he did the frescoes at the Detroit Institute of Arts back in 1932, uh, he had some assistants. One of his assistants was uh, Stephen uh, Dimitrov, and uh, he was from Flint, Michigan. And he went there, and he, I, I guess back in 1932, he was a young guy, and he worked with Diego Rivera. So uh, X amount of years later, um, they were in their 80s when I met them. Uh, he ended up teaching me and a few other people, there were 12 people in this class, they were trying to pass the art on, on how to do frescoes. Uh, and fresco, uh, the, the, the process of doing fresco has not changed in seven or 800 years uh, from the time that Michelangelo did the Sistine Chapel. It's still done the same. We have to hand make our paints, have to grind pigments, have to hand plaster wall. You know, you have to do all that. And uh, I end up learning. Uh, about this, and uh, let me interrupt you, but I want to make sure that I get this in here. Uh, you told me that they had to uh, reverse engineer the, the fresco yes. to get you to, in order to learn how to do it. Yeah, so you had you had to uh, you had you had to uh, I think the word you had to take everything apart. Correct? Yeah, so we had to reverse reverse engineer. Yes, yeah. So so we went. To, I went down to Mexico City. To see Siqueiros, Orozco, and Diego Rivera's work, and we wanted to, and I was taking pictures to see how they were doing portable panels back then. That was in the 1930s. So 1930s, they were doing portable panels. I went down there in 2000, and I believe it's 2006 uh, or so, so I can see how they were doing their portable panels because that's one of the things that we were doing for the Detroit Institute of Art, I mean, Flint Institute of Arts, was to uh, create the mural in another studio while they were doing the renovation at the Flint Institute of Arts. Uh, so we replicated the structure of, of how it was built here in, in, in Flint. We, we replicated that here in Detroit. We built the, we built the panels had the structural engineer come in and uh, and fabricators come in and uh, we replicated that wall here in the studio here in the city of Detroit. Created the frescoes, uh, created 20 something panels, had the panels shipped out and installed at the Flynn Institute of Arts. Uh, and that's how you got the, that's how you have the fresco that's up in there. And the fresco is 17 feet by 88 feet. That is so, that is so impressive. You know, when we look, a lot of times, I think when we look at an art piece, especially something like that, we look mm -hmm. at it and say that how beautiful it is. But when you start to think of the work and the thought and the passion that a person puts into it, all of a sudden that art comes alive and it's part of that person. And then when you do these murals for the city, 
this becomes part of that community. And I think if people look at it differently, they'll, I think they will learn to appreciate it more and exactly oh, what yeah. is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, the beauty of it all is it's the science, it's the math, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's all those things uh, rolled up in one. Science, the science is doing calculations for a weight load of something that can weigh uh, close to 500 pounds to a ton, you know? And then the math comes in on how do you break up space to create a composition so that you're able to create a piece of artwork that's fluent, but yet it holds together and yet it's still pleasing to the eye. So um, there, was a, there, was a, there was a mathematician called Jay Hembridge. Jay Hem uh, Dig Rivera studied up under Jay Hembridge. He was a mathematician that showed him how to break up space uh, on on uh, on the flat surface. When I say break up space, is that you have to have uh, sort of linear lines, diagonal lines, uh, vertical lines, so that you put down first, and then you create your composition. So, so, for example, you have a skeleton in your body, but if you didn't have a skeleton, where would you put your heart at, and where would you put your lungs at, and where would you put your brain at, and where would you put your muscles at if you didn't have a skeleton? So basically, I build an armature or a skeleton for the compositions that I create when I do these pieces of artwork. And that's one reason why I can organize things and create things in a way that it creates fluency. It's not a stagnant a visual piece of art, but it's a fluent art that has a lot of uh, depth because uh, I, I deal in, I don't deal just on the flat surface. I deal in with infinity. Infinity is that visually, physically, you can touch the wall and you feel the surface. But infinity, you can look at the wall and your eyes can go back as far as you want it to go visually. Dr. Massey, I'm going to ask, can you tell us um, a project or or showing that you did that was most rewarding to you or most significant or that? The most impact. Yes. I, I would sometimes say my first time doing this, but there's mm -hmm. some, but now over the years there have been a few things and just certain things yeah. stand out. So <laughs> so there's there's two there's two pieces that that really uh, that uh, that I did that I think are very significant. One was the Charles H. Wright Museum because that that was a piece to celebrate the African American experience. We have the largest African-American Museum in the United States that was designed, built, and created by African-Americans here in the city of Detroit. And the floor, I designed the floor 72 feet in diameter, and it tells the history of the city, uh, not the history of the city, but the history and the culture of African-American experiences. Around the actual design that's in the middle of the floor, is tiles that have names of people who made major contribution to the African American experience. Mm -hmm. So we have scholars that that do research and say, well, this year we're going to place. Uh, so I met Mae Jamerson. Mae Jamerson was the first African American woman an astronaut mm -hmm. that went into space. And then uh, there was another a general. I forget what his name is, but he was placed on the floor because he's deceased. So. But it was just a way of, uh, of celebrating the African-American experience. And then plus, the African-American Museum is a rotunda, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the only rotunda other than the one in Washington, D.C., where we have African-Americans laying in state like Coleman Young laid in state on my floor, Rosa Park laid in state on my floor, uh, Judge Damian Keith laid in state on the floor where lines are backed up all the way around the building to pay their respect and their due to these, these great people and, and these people who have made an impact on our lives. And all. Aretha Franklin laid in state on the floor at the Charles H. Wright Museum. And this is, this, and because of the piece that's designed to celebrate African-American experiences, uh, we have a real unique uh, spot here in the, in the United States that's in the city of Detroit. Yes.
Wow. Well, Dr. Massey, I really, we really enjoy, we could sit here all day and listen to you about this. I've, yeah. I've learned quite a bit. I really have. You know, one thing, you know, you're really a, you're really a, you're really down to earth, a really humble person. You really are. Oh, and thank you so very much. Yeah. All the accomplishments that you've had, you know, uh, you just, you, you know, to meet you, you could say, Hey, let's go get a cup of coffee and, I'd have to pay for yes. it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but really would like to thank you. Thank Cannot you. wait for you to get up here to hear you speak to some of these statistics, the kids and to the yes. to, to uh, federationists. Um, yes, yes. We just can't wait. And we're honored again, as we stated. And please, we hope mom will be there. Yeah, oh, we, my mom. Yeah, my mom. My mom will be there. And stuff. Uh, my dad. My dad is. My dad has moved on. He was. He was eighty-eight years old. Hmm. But I, I couldn't ask for a better father, oh, and, gosh, um, and 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 better parents. Does your mother still stand there and go, "All right, don't mess up now. Don't mess up." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. Hey, my my mother is eighty-eight years old. She still has her flip phone. She still drives a car, <laughs> and and she still lives in a house, uh, uh, and she's still independent, and so she's 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 doing quite well. What a blessing! <laughs> yeah, a blessing. You know, when you said it, I could hear a lot of things. She still she still <laughs> talks to her son too. Oh me? yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She does. You know yeah. what? Actually, this is, here's a funny one. I was at the I was at the church because we uh, brought my mom for Mother's Day, and. Um, I was getting ready to uh, introduce my mom, and my mom looked over. Don't you do that? But she, she didn't want to stand up. But my wife was next to her and said, "Oh, and this is and 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 this is my mother-in-law, uh, Betty Massey, and she had her stand up, and my mom stood up for that." But but my one of my my um, uh, church members had the church. He said, "I seen your mom look at you," and I said. You're right, and I didn't do anything. I just said right there. She she told me what to do, and I, I did it. So, so that? she still got she still got power. So yeah, bring up a child in the way he should go. He, he wants That's right. Her. That's right. I, I'm, one, I'm a product, and I think you are too. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 She yeah still, my like... mom still she still got she, my mom still got the look. So <laughs> the looks to do it right. Yeah. That's it. Well, at least they tell me my mother if she if she raises those shades and she look over that's at right. you, uh, you know the rest yeah, of it. That, that's right. That's right. <laughs> you know the rest. Well, we thank you for taking your time and spending with us this morning. Again, we want our viewers to know that the ticket sales are going very quickly. So we want you to visit. The Music Planet on yeah, Carpenter right, Road. Right. I'm going to let um, our, <laughs> our host here say The Music Planet. That, that was good. That, that was, was good. good. That I'm was trying. Good. <laughs> at TicketSpice.com. Join us. It benefits the families and the people that are visually impaired and awareness. And it allows us to live up to our motto, live the life you want. And you know, like I said, that's right. We're going to be putting on our high hats and our black tie. We're going to be stepping out Saturday <laughs> yes, night. Yes, and, yes. Uh, we're going to have a really good time. Like I said, again, here you get a chance to hear, hear Dr. Dr. Massey speak again. And if there's going to mm -hmm. be live entertainment, a little food, and you just have yep. a great time to kind of put the makeup on and dye the, dye the gray hair black. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. There you go. <laughs> just come on and have a good time. A good time. Remember right. the music. Music Planet and TicketSpice.com. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, where they're going, they're going really fast. If you want to be there, you better call the day. Uh, you got your ticket, right. Dr. Massey? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I do. Right. Again, we thank the Genesee District Library for hosting us each month. And we thank all of our supporters that have helped make this event a great event. Have a great afternoon. Thank we'll, you. We'll All right. Next month, same time, same library. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.